So good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Time for Webinar, Talking Positive Discussions to Maximize the Unit Survival and Responsible Antibiotic Usage. And my name is Nia Davis, and I'm the Research and Development Officer for Herbicide Cumbry, Meet Promotion Wales. And uh, tonight we will be hearing from Dr. Alex Corbishley, a senior lecturer in farm animal health at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, Alex has worked at the university for about six years and has previously worked as a vet in Northamptonshire and Cheshire. And additionally, then we have Liz King joining us, and we have one of the senior scientists for H2E, and Bruce Parkey, uh, head of industry development at Optimate Scotland. So, a um, bit of an introduction. The aim of the neonatal survival project is to was to benchmark, define the risk factors for, and per, 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 propose an integrated control plan to improve survival and reduce morbidity and antibiotic use in neonatal lambs and sickle calves in Great Britain. So um, the neonatal survival project was funded by the three levy boards, HTB, HCC, and uh, QOS, and this was through the Rin Fence Fund, which is an interim arrangement by long term solution is sort of issue where we've been collected as point slaughter in England um, for animals which should be related to Scotland Wits. So the um, kind of plan of action for this evening is that Alex will take us through a 30 minute presentation and then there will be time for questions at the end. Um, Alex has a good presentation slide explaining how to ask a question. So um, if, if you think of a question please type it into the question box at any time. Um, it usually sits on the right hand side of the screen and um, you can see this box. You may need to click on a small orange arrow to open up this box and then click on the question drop down and you'll see where you can type your question. So as usual everyone will be uh, muted during this webinar so uh, please do let us know in the box if you have any technical issues. And to kind of kick us off um, we're going to head into a poll. Lovely. Alex, thanks yeah. very much, Nia. I'll um I'll just quickly go through my header slide and then we'll we'll head on to the poll. So um so yeah, uh, good evening everybody. As Nia said, um, I was one of the lead scientists on this project that the three levy boards have funded over the past two years. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do this evening is spend about 40 minutes going through the key findings of the project. Um, and what we're planning to do with the results going forward. Uh, but before we do that, it would be quite nice to get your views on a poll question that I think uh, Bruce is going to come up with. Now, if you do want to ask questions at any point, uh, what we'll do is we'll do the questions at the end. So you need to click the little orange button on your panel, and then you should have the ability to type a question in there and uh, the levy board team will compile the questions at the end. I'm gonna try and leave a good 20, 25 minutes towards the end uh, to have a discussion uh, around some of the findings or, or questions you've got. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over for, for the poll question. And uh, it's just to get your feel for the motivations uh, for farmers when it comes to neonatal mortality and survival. Yeah, so um, what motivates farmers to improve survival? Um, if you could just select one of the um, polls answers. Grand, thanks very much. Can everyone see those results now? I think I can see them on the audience view slide. So um, about half of you said that they'd feel guilty if they didn't uh, address it. And I think that's really interesting that, that um, you know, half of you have said that. The other three responses seem to be relatively evenly split across those that you, of you that responded. Uh, there was a big component to this project that looked at motivations and um, sort of behavioural factors behind why farmers want to work on improving neonatal survival and actually internal uh, motivations. So feeling guilty about it or doing it because it was the right thing 
uh, were really strong motivators, and, and we'll look at that later on. So it's, it's interesting to see that half of you recognise that as, um, you know, sort of a really key motivator for them, much less so than what us as vets might be telling them to do or how they might be being judged by the people. So that's fantastic. Okay, that, that um, gets us started. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll head back into the slides and we'll come back to the social sciences stuff a bit, a bit later on. Grand. So I guess this project really stemmed from a number of uh, reviews that have been done uh, in you know, not too distant past, sort of past four or five years. Uh, this is one that was done by Cathy Dreyer's group that, that really set out the landscape of the problem in that there's been quite a lot of work done to look at the biological factors that underpin neonatal survival, particularly in, in small ruminants, but also in, in suckler calves as well. Uh, but really not a lot of progress made in actually changing survival within the industry over the past 40 years. So this project set out um, to answer a few key questions around neonatal survival. And it was a collaboration between the vet schools in Edinburgh, Nottingham and Liverpool, and also with Synergy Farm Health uh, down the southwest of England. And the key things we wanted to look at in this project was we wanted to get some up-to-date uh, numbers on neonatal lamb uh, and suckler calf survival in, the, in GB. We wanted to look at current practices and how they might be related to survival. We wanted to look at barriers and enablers to change, so the behavioural drivers behind what farmers do and why. And then we also wanted to look at some uh, very specific questions in terms of the biology that hadn't really been looked at in sheep as much. So things like metabolic status in ewes and how that's related to lamb survival and performance. Looking at routine antibiotic treatment, so specifically oral uh, aminoglycoside treatment at birth. Um, and then also in a project that was aligned to this, uh, that, that was funded actually by HDB and the University of Edinburgh before this project started, was to look at the risk factors factors for failure of passive transfer in, in suckler calves. So it's a sort of a combined set of projects and what I'll do is I'll talk through each of the studies we did in, in turn and then try and wrap things up towards the end. So the big bit of this study was, was a survey based uh, questionnaire that went out uh, across GB uh, and it was an online far farmer survey that we ran in 2018 where we were looking to benchmark performance between flocks and suckler herds. We wanted to understand the current practices in those uh, flocks and herds and we wanted to also assess the attitudes of the stockmen and women to neonatal survival. We then followed up with a group of those farmers in 2019, either with lambing students on the farm, so vet students recording the data, so recording actual survival numbers, or the vets ringing up every week, uh, particularly for the suckler farms, uh, to record the actual performance in 2019. Uh, this was also accompanied by some uh, focused interviews and five different practices across England, Scotland and Wales with vets and farmers to look at the um, behavioural factors that we were interested in. And then also an experimental trial that we did up in Edinburgh, looking at those biological factors. So we wanted to understand new metabolic status, lamb passive transfer status, and we measured that in all the ewes and all the lambs in our flock. Uh, we randomized the lambs to getting an oral antibiotic or placebo uh, and then we looked at the relationship between these and, and lamb performance. So first of all with, with the online survey uh, that was promoted to all of the levy payers, uh, so all the beef and lamb levy payers at least across England, Scotland and Wales. So it went out to a lot of farms uh, and it was only accessed a couple of thousand times and actually out of all the folk it went round, it was only started by about 380 folk. Now it was a pretty detailed survey and actually of the people that started it, they were, they were committed to answering it. We had just over 200 farms complete it. But as you can see, we're, we're only sampling a small proportion of the overall levy pays. Um, there's a bit of uh, concentration around certain areas where um, our practices were or, or where vet students went, which um, meant there was some geographic bias to the survey. But overall, we ended up with 23 suckler-only farms, 125 sheep-only farms, and then 50 farms, 55 farms that had both a lambing flock and, and a suckler herd. And the big driver in actually recruiting our sheep flocks with the students, you know, 111 out of our 180 lambing flocks in total were recruited either by, by the vet or, or the vet students. 
In terms of the recording that the vets and the vet students did, uh, they did the online survey with the farm to make sure that that was completed. And as I said a second ago, the vets rang up uh, the farms every uh, week. So for the vet followed farms, we've got their data for the whole 2019 season. For the students, they actually did daily records of lamb survival, but only for when they were on the farm. So we had different windows of time. For some students, it was a few days. For some, it was, it was a few weeks of the lambing period. So in terms of the headline numbers that we got back from the farms, if we look at lamb survival first, if we look at mortality to 21 days old, it was on average, it was just over 10% mortality. Now you can see there's a fair uh, range there if we look at the interquartile range. Um, and if we look at where the majority of that mortality was taking place, it was in the first seven days. So 9.5% of lambs were dying in the first seven days and only a very small uh, proportion of additional mortality was, was taking place after that time. I put on uh, on this uh, graph all of the farms that we collected data for. You can see here the mean plotted in red, and you can see the distribution around that mean. So there are some farms that are recording uh, very low levels of uh, mortality uh, during the, the study time, whereas others where we're getting quite high levels. Now, some of these outliers up here um, may well be where uh, maybe a student was only on a farm for a few days. Uh, and they had a particularly high number of losses during that time. We can't exclude that as a possibility, but if you, uh, even if you exclude the outliers right at the extremes, you can see quite a bit of variation around, around that average. Obviously, we had a smaller number of suckler farms, uh, but in the group that we looked at, first thing to note is we did have a number of farms that had absolutely no mortality recorded at all during the study period, uh, which probably doesn't come as a surprise to those of you that are working with suckler farms regularly. Um, and on average, in the first three weeks of life, um, we're, they were losing around six and a half, six point six percent of their calves. Um, and again, as with the lambs, as you'd expect, uh, the vast majority of that mortality taking place in the first seven days with just over 5% of, of uh, mortality taking place during that time. So those are the headline numbers in terms of what overall mortality looked like uh, on the lambing and the calving uh, flocks and herds. And what we wanted to do is try and look for associations with management practices. And we went through a very long list of different things that the farms uh, might be doing. So everything from feeding practices through to perinatal management, um, management colostrum, hygiene, bedding, uh, what they were doing with respect to turnout, grouping, a whole range of different factors uh, that might impact on lamb survival and calf survival. And when we looked at lamb survival, there were really no strong associations between any single management practice. Uh, and that's not that different to the results of some work that was done about 20 years ago in a similar way. They put vet students onto farms uh, to do uh, really what, what we've done. And, and interestingly, the headline mortality numbers really haven't changed over that 20 year period since that work was done. Um, and that's probably because there are lots of little things that are contributing to uh, lamb and calf survival and trying to pull out any single one thing, particularly with the size of study we had, it's not as if we had four or 5,000 farms, we had you know, less than 200 uh, lambing flocks and, and less than 100 uh, settler farms. So it was interesting on the sheet, there wasn't really a single factor. Of particular note though, there was no association with either farm size or with the uh, staff to breeding female ratio. And those are things that are quite often looked at, uh, particularly you know, the, the staffing number on, on a unit. Um, and there was no association there at all between uh, lamb or calf survival uh, and the number of breeding females they had to uh, the number of staff or the number of animals or the acreage of the farm either. And that was suggested actually, it's more about the quality of uh, supervision rather than the absolute ratio. Um, and large farms, which of course are increasingly getting uh, more attention in the public eye, are not more likely to have more losses. So it's not as if becoming a bigger farm or more efficient with labor automatically results in more wastage and, and less efficiency with respect to survival. Uh, as you might expect, uh, there was a bit of an increase in mortality in outdoor lambing flocks. I don't think that would, would come to a surprise. Uh, the mixed category here are flocks uh, that were having ewes and lambs outside during the day, but were bringing them in at night. A relatively small number, but, but not an insignificant number. So yeah, a bit more variability uh, and a trend towards higher mortality in outdoor lambing flocks. And then no difference in calf survival as to whether they were calving indoors or outdoors. Thank <laughs> you.
Even though the number of suckler farms in the study was small, there were a few interesting observations around calf survival. And I've just pulled out two or three of um, the plots from that, of things that sort of fit with other evidence in the literature um, that, that raised a few eyebrows when we looked at them. So the first one was the type of farm. So was it a beef only unit or was it a sheep and beef unit? And on the flip side for the sheep farms, was it a sheep only unit or was it a beef and sheep unit? And interestingly, lamb mortality was very similar uh, between sheep only farms and beef and sheep farms. However, we did notice that mortality was higher in calves uh, on a beef and sheep unit than it would have than it was on the beef only unit and we're not exactly sure why this is we suspect it might be to do with supervision and labor and, and the way that staff and resources are allocated on the farm but it was interesting to note that on the units where they had both beef and sheep the calves seemed to not do as well as on the units where they were only doing uh, suckler calves and didn't have a lambing flock alongside the other thing that was of note in the suckler farms was when they were moving cows and calves. You'll know with the farms you work with that you know, there are a whole range of different husbandry systems. People are housing and grouping animals in different ways. Some are using calving pens, some aren't. Some are moving animals immediately after calving, others maybe a day or, or a week later. Uh, and we asked just a very simple question, uh, you know, do you move uh, your calf, your cows uh, after calving or do you move them before calving um, and of course we had a bunch of farms that didn't respond at all. Now the guys that moved their animals, their cows and calves 24 hours after calving into a different pen had a lower mortality rate than those that were moving them before calving. Now there's some interesting work that came out of Canada a few years ago where they showed something similar where if you change groups or move animals, uh, cattle, sorry, uh, in the days preceding calving, you do actually see an increase in neonatal mortality and reduced survival. So it's interesting that that came through in our survey data and that it actually matches up with data shown uh, in other countries as well. And on simple things, for example, how you group animals and how you move them around the time of calving, uh, trying to have them in stable groups up until the point of calving and then moving them afterwards would seem to be more beneficial uh, than trying to uh, change their groups in the run up to calving. The other one that was interesting was uh, in terms of bedding practices. So we asked a range of questions around bedding. Um, some folk chose not to answer the question, uh, but one of the questions we asked was, do you bed them daily? Do you bed them weekly? Do you bed them when they look dirty? Do you bed them at some other time? Uh, and the, anim the farms where they waited for the animals to look dirty before bedding them down reported higher levels of mortality compared to ones that were bedding on a regular basis, either say daily or weekly. Now, again, we need to be a bit careful about how we interpret that. This might be, um, you know, farms that only bed them when they're dirty have other problems with their management that they're not addressing. But it was an interesting uh, correlation with, with mortality, uh, demonstrating that potentially if herds that are actually waiting until the animals look dirty before bedding them down are opening themselves up to more problems with uh, neonatal disease and reduced survival. The other thing that was quite apparent when we looked at the data was there's a real problem with consistency of performance. So what we did was we compared what the farmers reported in terms of newborn calf or newborn lamb survival in 2018, and then what our vets or vet students recorded as their performance in 2019. Now, whenever I show this to slides, people talk about the beast from the east, or they talk about having a particularly good year or a bad year. And of course, everybody has a good year and everybody has a bad year. But if you want to make improvements, you need to have consistency. And we don't know whether this inconsistency between years is due to differences in recording, i.e. Um, the vets and the vet students recording more accurately than, than what the farmers were reporting from the previous year, or whether it represents uh, genuine variability. It's probably a little bit of both. But if you were to think about the pig industry or the poultry industry, very, very different systems, of course, a lot more of the factors under their control. But that's really what they're aiming for is consistency so that they can have continual improvement, you know, year on year or batch on batch. And if you're looking at farms here where you're having, you know, maybe 20, 25 percent mortality in one year um, and then very low mortality the following year or, or vice versa. It's very, very difficult to make improvements when you're still struggling to achieve consistency. 
On the flip side, there are some farms that are very consistent. So in, t in the kind of green boxes here between two years, there are you know, a, not an insignificant number of farms that are able to achieve uh, consistent performance year on year. And, and that's something that's certainly worth looking at in terms of working with uh, farms to say, you know, are you seeing big variations between years? If so, why? Um, and can we address that variability first before we start getting onto all the sort of marginal gains, smaller things that we can work on to improve performance uh, after that? Now, probably again, a little surprise to you guys, but um, it was worth us just capturing what proportion of farms were actually recording accurate data and how they were recording it. And, and we asked them for their 2018 performance, uh, how they came up with the numbers that they gave us. And about 60% of the beef and about a quarter of the sheep farms said that they used some paper records. Uh, a smaller proportion and only sort of one in 10 sheep farms uh, reported using computer records. But the vast majority of the sheep farmers, so two thirds of the sheep farmers that gave us the number said that they're giving us their best estimates from memory. So again, uh, that's something that's well established anecdotally between us, but it really did pull out the lack of data recording, particularly in the sheep. Uh, sector. Um, and over one in three, actually nearly 40% of lambing flocks reported keeping no records at all. Uh, so that 2018 number they gave us may well have been them, uh, sort of, well it was for 40% of them, uh, their best guess as to what their performance was. Um, and you know, in, for many of these flocks it was substantially different to what um, was then recorded the subsequent year when, when the vets or the vet students were recording survival. So we then moved on to talking to the farmers a little bit about the motivators uh, behind why it is what they do. And that was what underpinned that question at the start of the webinar. And we asked questions that tried to unpick sort of the internal versus the external motivators behind uh, their behavior. Um, and we asked some questions like, I'm concerned about neonatal losses in my flock, or neonatal survival is important for the success of my business, or neonatal survival in my herd of flock is, is better than average. And they were asked to score that on a Likert scale, so just a simple scale of not at all true uh, at one and all the way up to very true at seven. Um, and as you might expect, uh, neonatal survival in my herd of flock is better than average was sort of distributed around the middle uh, value. So, you know, half of them thought they were better than average, half of them thought they weren't, which is kind of reassuring, but we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a second. Um, a real recognition that it was important for their business um, and maybe a slight bias towards folk being concerned, but, you know, almost as many folk being, you know, I'm not so worried about it in my flock. Uh, all my herd as those that are worried, but a real recognition of its importance. Now, we didn't have enough data to drill down for the sucklers, but for the sheep, it was interesting in that we could plot the lamb mortality for their flock in 2019 against how they felt uh, with respect to the statement of neonatal survival in their flock being better than average. So um, the guys who said six, they were, um, you know, they felt they were very much better than average, and the guys that said zero said they were very, very much worse than average. And uh, within sort of the middle of the scale, as folk felt more confident that their performance was better than average, generally, yes, land mortality on their flocks did improve. Although there's still about a quarter of the farms here that thought they were performing better than average who were actually performing worse than average. Now, this is an effect that's well reported in social sciences. Uh, Katie Adam, who was the postdoc who really drove this work, um, educated me a bit on the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, and actually, the most confident farmers, uh, thinking that they were the, you know, the most likely to be performing better than average, or well, more than half of them were performing worse than the mean that we recorded during our study. So generally, it seems like they have a reasonable understanding of, of how they perform, but the most confident folk are often uh, quite inaccurate in terms of how their performance relates to how their perception of their performance relates to their actual performance. And um, it's therefore quite tricky to sort of rely on um, their perception of performance without having the data behind it to really look and see uh, how their actual performance compares to you know, the industry standard or the target that they might be aiming for. So we then went on to talk to them a little bit about um, how they feel they could uh, influence neonatal survival. Um, quite as, you know, on all of these questions, they felt relatively uh, more confident in their abilities. 
Um, they felt that they were able to improve neonatal survival. Uh, they felt they could do that through routine management, and they also felt, felt able to meet that as a challenge. So generally speaking, um, they were sort of up for the challenge, and they felt confident in their abilities to do it, um, and, and wanted to sort of address that through routine management. But then when we asked them why they did it, um, again, this goes back to the poll and, and the half of you really kind of siding with what the farmers have told us, is that there was a real strong autonomous motivator. So this was coming from inside them and wanting to do a good job. So for them, having good neonatal survival was part of being a good farmer. Um, it's part of the right way of doing things. Um, you know, it's the best thing for their herd or flock uh, and it's something they want to do. And that's really important when we think about how we frame the discussion on farm and, and how we approach it. You know, we're talking to the converted, we're talking to people who uh, want to make an improvement, they recognise this is important, they feel well equipped to do it. Um, and really what other people think of them or what their vet is advising them to do uh, isn't a strong motivator for them wanting to improve survival. Um, you know, the underlying motivator is coming from inside. And you know, there's there's one here that um, there's a really interesting quote I'll show you in a minute that came out was you know, they just feel bad um, about themselves if they weren't doing what they could to improve neonatal survival, um, or they'd be feeling guilty if they weren't taking action. And that was really summed up by one of the quotes we got back uh, in the structured interviews that were done. And, and the farmer, when they spoke with Katie, said, you know, I just don't like losing things. And I take it really, really badly when I do. And it's not about money. It's more about you want everything to do as well as it can. And that was a really strong message that, that came out in the discussions. So Katie went out and she did uh, interviews, I think with about 12 vets and a few more farmers across um, five different practices. And it was quite an interesting discussion because she had the vets and the farmers there together um, and trying to compare both their perceptions of what each other did and, and you know, when they disagreed with each other, where, where that was. And you, during those discussions, there were some really obvious practical barriers to change. And again, I don't think these will surprise most of you. So you know, practical things like housing, shelter, particularly on tenanted farms, you know, of the tenanted farms they spoke to, there were real challenges in terms of addressing uh, capital expenditure and improving things like housing and shelter. And then of course, things like staffing and, and staff costs and, and time, uh, major practical barriers to change that, that wouldn't surprise us. The one thing that came out quite strongly, and I've not put lots of the quotes in here, um, but it was really interesting looking at some of the headlines from the discussions around the cultural barriers to change. And actually, there was a real social stigma behind talking about losses. Uh, and that's really why we're, we're trying to talk a lot more about survival. Uh, of course, we do need to look at losses, but if we can really focus on the positive messages around survival, hopefully that will help to address uh, the emotional discomfort that was really highlighted as a barrier to talking about uh, neonatal survival and actually recording uh, neonatal survival and recording ultimately losses. Uh, and now it's that emotional discomfort and that social stigma around talking about it, which is one of the big barriers to actually making progress uh, in, in the area. However, in terms of drivers for improvement, there were really high levels of motivation, uh, a real recognition of the financial emotional benefits uh, to improve survival and you know, it feels good when your calves and your lambs are doing well um, and a real sort of desire to get back to the basics and to think about how we can address some of the, sort of the fundamental things around husbandry, nutrition, hygiene and how that can feed into improving uh, calf and lamb survival. And some of the quotes that came out of the interviews, I think, really make those points quite nicely. So, um, you know, one of the things that came from one of the farmers was one of the problems I think that there is is that farmers don't talk. You're not going to say to people, uh, you know, by the way, we had 40 calves dead this year. You just, you're not going to do that. So, you're really highlighting that that stigma behind talking about um, losses, particularly when they're quite high. Um, a comment from a vet, there are a few farmers that in the last 12 months I've had to sort of signpost to a few help organisations. So really, um, you know, when they're talking about neonatal survival, uh, the vets are coming back and saying, well, actually, we've, we've had clients where um, you know, it has hit them quite bad and, and we have been worried about their mental well-being. 
Um, and then this sort of thinking about drives for improvement and, and you know, what what folk want to focus on. Uh, again, coming from both farmers and vets, you know, sometimes I think we get away from the basics too far, and we've just got to go back to the basics. Uh, and then nutrition, getting that right, hygiene and colostrum. If you can get those three things right, I generally think most of it probably follows itself. So a recognition of some of sort of those important drivers to um, improving survival. So I'm, I'm going to change pace a little bit and move on to a different part of the study and, and sort of thinking about some of those basics. We wanted to look in our own flock uh, what the determinants were of lamb survival. So this is a teaching flock um, up in Edinburgh. And what we wanted to look at was the metabolic status of the ewes, the passive transfer status of the lambs, uh, and then the impact of an oral aminoglycoside at, at birth. And we wanted to determine, you know, can we predict uh, which factors are more likely to give us nice, happy lambs looking like this versus uh, lambs that are sick or go on to die or perform poorly. So that's Rob Kelly, one of our vets in, in the practice. He did a lot of the work uh, with me in, at lambing time in year and a, nearly two years ago now that's scary um, and our flock it's a March and April lambing lowland flock it's about 250 ewes that we lamb in March or April there's there's another smaller group of ewes that lamb earlier on for teaching purposes but it's 250 ewes in this study uh, and generally you know these are pampered pampered sheep living in a nice uh, vet school environment so they're in pretty good body condition um, and for this study, well, they're scanned every year, and for this study, we bled every year to metabolic profile her. And then the lambs, uh, we don't rear triplets in the university flock, so normally they'd be fostered on for this year um, because we didn't want to interfere with the study design. Uh, the weakest triplet was taken away and artificially reared uh, on the milk machine. Um, so for this study, we've only got singles and twins, whether they're born as a twin or a triplet, and um, we monitored them from birth through to weaning. Uh, we looked at lamb growth and we recorded all the disease incidences in the farm. Uh, as I said, we randomized them to antibiotic or placebo and it was double blinded. We, um, we actually never bothered unblinding it. I'll show you why at the end when, when I show you the result. But you know, the farmers had no idea what they were actually dosing the lambs with. Uh, and we took a serum sample from the lambs for IgG measurements, so antibody measurement for passive transfer. At between 8 and 24 hours old, it had to be practical. Uh, they get kicked out the lambing pens after about a day um, and it's very difficult to keep track of stuff uh, after that time so you know, it was 8 to 24 hours old blood samples in terms of something that we could practically apply in a flock that was, was trying to um, run within a reasonably commercial uh, management system. So uh, we blood sampled them all sort of around the 4th of March, which is sort of last two to three weeks of pregnancy. Um, and then they started lambing on the 25th of March and we tracked them all the way through and recorded all of their uh, treatments and then their weights at weaning, which is around the start of August, if they hadn't already been sold or weaned before that. But we made sure we got uh, a weight and a date for all of them. So the first thing to look at was the metabolic status of our flock pre-lambing. So this is a flock that are fed good quality haylage. Uh, the singles are not supplemented at all. In fact, the singles come in quite late. Uh, and then the twins and triplets get fed a flat rate um, of concentrate from, I think, about a month off lambing. Uh, there's no difference in feeding between the twins and the triplets. So the first thing we looked at was beta-hydroxybutyrate, so a measure of short-term energy balance. I've already said the vast majority of these users are in pretty good body condition. I'm talking three plus. Um, and we've got a small number of ewes, one, two, three, four, five, that sort of would be considered to have an elevated BOHB level, so something over 0.9. You've got a few triplets that are approaching that number. Um, we'll come back to that later. Small number, but interesting results from that small number. And for us, that was good news because actually there's been loads of work in the 80s. There's been some really nice, more recent work done in uh, Canada, really showing the importance of U energy balance and lamb survival. So we, we didn't really want lots of using poor energy balance because we kind of knew what the result of that would be. We then looked at urea nitrogen levels in the blood. So this is a proxy for ERDP supply, so rumen degradable protein. Um, and you can see that even though they're all in the same forage and the twins and triplets are actually getting more uh, protein coming in through the concentrate than the singles are, but you can see the urea N levels dropping uh, with increasing uh, 
fetal number. Again, not that many below our cutoff. We use a cutoff of 1.7, um, but interesting trend there, really showing probably the impact of uh, reduced abdominal space on the amount of forage those ewes were able to eat. We looked at albumin as a long-term measure of protein balance, um, and that was a bit surprising for us. So um, we use a cutoff of 30 grams per litre. We're using um, plasma for these. Um, so I'm not going to get hung up about the cutoff of 30. It can be argued either way, but the trend is interesting and significant when we look at that later. In the, the uh, twins had, on average, a higher albumin level than the singles and the triplets. And the single surprised us. We didn't expect the singles to be lower than the twins. Probably makes sense given that the singles were not getting any supplementary feeding at all, and that the twins were getting the same amount of supplementary feeding as the triplets. So the triplets have a higher demand, and that's probably what's pulling their blood albumin down a bit more. And then the final thing we look at is, is globulin, um, just because we've measured albumin and total protein, we can obviously calculate the globulin, just to see if there are any individual use. It looks like they're suffering with a chronic inflammatory condition, so lameness, dental disease and the like, and actually only a couple of use that had substantially elevated globulin levels. So generally, we can conclude in our flock, they were pretty good body condition, most of them in good uh, short-term energy balance as well, and very few with any signs of any concurrent disease problems or sort of inflammatory disease problems at least. If we look at the uh, results for the lambs, so these are the blood sample results in terms of blood IgG levels, so serum IgG of the lambs at 8 to 24 hours old, and they're coloured in whether they were triplets, twins or singles. Um, about 1 in 10 had an IgG level of under 10 mg per mil, and about one in three had an IgG level of below 24 mg per mil. Why did we choose those thresholds? Well, they're the thresholds that have been used in dairy and beef, and there aren't any defined for uh, sheep. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but interestingly, that's almost identical to the proportions we saw in the suckler calf study that we did. So, you know, very similar distribution uh, in terms of blood IgG between uh, the sheep that we looked at and the cattle we looked at um, in our other study, which I'll show you shortly. So if we looked at the factors that um, affected losses between scanning and 24 hours old, so you know, what we wanted to do was understand uh, what potentially predicted whether a ewe was going to lose a lamb between her scanning date and when they were released from the lambing pens a day after lambing. Now, none of our singles lost any lambs during this time. About 9% of our twin carrying ewes lost at least one lamb, and about a third of our triplet carrying ewes lost at least one lamb between scanning and 24 hours. Of course, there'll be the odd scanning error, but, but not many. So you know, we can sort of see what you would probably expect there. And when we looked at the factors analyzed, um, we looked at age, body condition score, the number of lambs that were scanned with, the total litter birth weight, and then the metabolic parameters as well. As you'd expect from that data, and probably intuitively, the more lambs you scanned with, the more likely you are to lose one. I don't think that's going to set the world on fire. But out of the, all of the metabolic parameters we looked at um, and, and the other things we, we examined, it was actually albumin that came out as a predictor of uh, lamb loss. So the ewes that lost a lamb between scanning and 24 hours old uh, had on average lower blood albumin than those ewes that didn't. So there's some relationship there between the long-term protein status of the ewe uh, and the likelihood of her losing a lambing, uh, losing a lamb, sorry, uh, up to the first 24 hours of, of life. We then wanted to look at the factors that are actually underpinning blood antibody levels. So could we uh, determine what is impacting on whether a lamb is likely to have an IgG level below the 24 mg per mil cutoff? Um, and you'll see in a minute why we've, why we've gone for that. Um, and we looked at the stage of the lambing period, so was it born early or late? We looked at the lamb weight, its sex, the size of the litter, the total birth weight, the age of the ewe, the ewe's body condition, again, the metabolic parameters. Again, as you'd probably expect, uh, triplet lambs more likely to have a lower IgG level. Uh, in fact, three times more likely to be below that cutoff. Well, not exactly, it's an odds ratio, but they had an odds ratio of 2.98, so roughly three times more likely. Um, and then again, I flanked up the BOHB, so the butyrhydroxybutyrate, ewes that are in excessive negative energy balance in the run up to lambing are more likely to have lambs with lower IgG levels and quite a lot more likely, the odds ratio there of over five. <laughs> 
So even though we had a very small number of views with elevated BOHB, it came through as a strongly significant effect. So kind of you know, one of the factors of being in poor energy balance in the run-up to lambing is that your lambs are more likely to have low blood IgG levels, which will impact on survival. We then wanted to look at what factors were influencing performance after 24 hours old, and we had a bit of a problem here in that we powered our study for a higher level of lamb mortality and disease, and uh, we actually had quite a low level of lamb mortality and, and disease uh, in, in the flock this year. So only 4% of the lambs died, and only just over 2.5% needed treatment. So it was a pretty good year overall. Uh, and for that reason, we didn't really have enough power to look at uh, how the um, IgG levels, new metabolic parameters, for example, were impacting on lamb survival and, and disease levels. But we did look at um, growth, and the average daily live weight gain was around 0.3. That's the distribution of all our lambs because we weighed them all both at, at birth and um, at weaning. The top third of lambs, they had a mean uh, growth rate of 0.35. The bottom third had a mean growth rate of 0.26. And we wanted to look at the risk factors for having a growth rate of under 0.26, so being uh, less than the average of the bottom third performing lambs. And interestingly, what came out significant then, I said I'd come back to that cutoff, lambs uh, that had a blood IgG of under 24 mg per mil uh, had an odds ratio of nearly five, an odds ratio of 4.75 um, for, um, for being in that poorer growth group of lambs. So you know, a real relationship there between that beef cutoff of 24 mg per mil IgG um, and, and lamb performance. The other thing we of course looked at was that oral antibiotic treatment and we never unblinded it because we had no statistical significant uh, difference between um, the placebo control and the antibiotic treated groups in terms of growth um, and as I said we had a very small number of, of mortalities or treatments in, in the flock at all but you know, re no relationship um, between oral antibiotic treatment and, and land performance in, in this flock. So uh, in the last few minutes, I'll just go through some of the uh, data we've got for suckler herds that we've looked at. Uh, and this is a separate study um, that, as I said at the start, came before this one. And it was um, really driven by Rachel Bragg, who's one of our residents here in Edinburgh. Um, and as I said, was funded jointly with AHDB and, and the university. And Rachel looked at failure passive transfer across about 86 farms, um, predominantly across Scotland and England, but there were one or two in Wales. Uh, on average, the herds were about 135 cows in size. Some of you may have seen some of this data that she's presented previously. Um, and there was sort of around, what, two thirds continental, about a third native, vast majority calving indoors. And, and she sampled uh, just over a thousand cows for metabolic status. We won't look at that today, but she sampled nearly 1200 calves. Um, well, she did the ones in Scotland and, and the vets that kindly worked with us elsewhere in GB uh, sampled the others. And if we look at failure passive transfer in suckler herds, uh, that's the distribution of um, the proportion of cows with an IgG level of under 10, and that's the proportion of cows with an IgG level of under 24 grams per litre. Um, and th the headline for this is very similar to the lamb one. I've shown you the, the overall sort of distribution between farms there, but actually it was around one in three calves were below the 24 gram per litre, um, and around one in 10 were below the um, 10 grams per litre cutoff. And the key risk factors in the suckler cows were interesting. Um, being supplemented with additional colostrum was a major risk factor for having lower IgG levels. So these are calves that had no assistance to colostrum. These are the ones that were led to the dam and helped to suck. These were the ones that were either bottle or tube fed the dam's own colostrum. And these were the ones that were either bottle or tube fed artificial colostrum. So the key kind of take home message from this is farmers are very good at identifying lambs that need assistance. But whatever assistance they're getting is either too late or insufficient to get them back up to where they would have been otherwise. Uh, again, this will be a risk factor that's come across through another work, but having an assisted calving uh, leaves calves at increased risk of, of failure of passive transfer. So um, probably not a surprise to a lot of you, but did come through in, in Rachel's work. And then again, things that pop up in some studies and not in others, so it's sort of inconsistent, but really strong in, in her study was being male, being a twin and being born to a heifer uh, were also risk factors for having low, lower blood antibody levels. 
and it was linking her data into some of the survey data we got that we thought was quite interesting in that we asked the farmers in that survey that we did uh, how much colostrum they actually fed to calves and lambs and if we think about lambs uh, sorry calves we typically talk about 10 percent body weight uh, a lot of us talk about giving them what three and a half four liters in the first six hours of life the vast majority of farmers are giving what two liters or less Similarly with the lambs, the vast majority of farmers that are giving additional colostrum are giving well under 200 mils um, of colostrum to lambs. So when we look at Rachel's data showing that actually being assisted with colostrum feeding is a major risk factor of failure passive transfer, and then we survey the farmers and ask them how much they give, it's actually not that surprising given um, how the volumes are substantially lower than what we would typically recommend. The other thing Rachel looked at, which was curious, uh, was calving assistance. So given that calving assistance is a known risk factor for failure of passive transfer, something she found in her work, um, she looked at for these calves, so these are all calves that were delivered vaginally, and these were all calves that were alive at sort of between two and seven days old to actually get blood sample for failure of passive transfer. But the risk factors for calving assistance um, were, as you would expect, um, and consistent with other studies, being a twin, being born to a heifer, being male, so being a bit bigger. But surprisingly, and one thing we didn't expect to see was actually thinner animals were more likely to need assistance with calving. Now we need to be careful, we didn't have any severely obese animals in her study, and actually there's very few cows that were body condition score four and a half. I think it's fewer than 10 animals here. So, and we didn't have any caesareans in here. So this is a skewed population of calves. Uh, these are the ones that were born vaginally and, and were alive. Uh, at the time of sampling, but a really interesting association here with cows that are in poor body condition, so cows that are either underfed or ill for some other reason that at increased risk of um, needing calving assistance, and conversely, well not conversely, and, and leading on from that, we know these calves are both more likely to die and more likely to have failure of passive transfer. Uh, we've also looked a little bit at uh, cow and calf size and, and the ratio between the two. Um, so what we've got here is the calf weight by each farm. So each of these points is a farm and these are all the calves on that farm that we looked at. We've got the average cow weight uh, for the farm. So it's actually not the same cows that gave birth to the calves because that's quite hard to do uh, on a commercial farm, but um, just the average body weight of the cows on the farm, and then a ratio, just the percent body weight of the cows being born to the cows. And again, in her work, she had an odds ratio of over one and a half for calves that were more than 8% uh, of the average cow's body weight in the farm. So uh, thinking a little bit about selecting for calf size, um, that sort of 8% number seems to be important in terms of predicting calving assistance. So wrapping things up, I've been through quite a lot quite quickly there, um, but I'm keen to leave time to, to have a bit of a discussion. So um, in terms of looking at things going forward for the UK industry, um, we do need to think of imaginative ways of addressing the barriers to recording and discussing performance. So getting over these uh, sort of social and um, sort of stigmas around actually uh, talking about and then recording uh, mortality and, and trying to move that discussion forward onto a sort of positive message around survival potentially is one way of doing that. Uh, but we're all really open-minded. We'd like to discuss um, different ways that we can try and get over that, that stigma. Um, we do need to try and agree some targets for improvement. Um, you know, one of the things that came through in the social sciences that I didn't have time to talk about today uh, was really a lot of farms feeling that maybe you know, blanket industry targets may not be that applicable to them. They wanted to be involved in uh, agreeing a target for, for the farm and, and you know, agreeing as to what was achievable and which direction they should move in. Uh, but, but we do need to agree um, some targets for improvement. Uh, and then also co really coming through from the risk factor analysis there is that practical improvements really need to be farm specific. There's clearly lots of things when we look at the biology that impact on survival, but no one thing comes out as really strong as common across all farms. So sort of a generic five point plan like we had for mastitis or like we have for uh, essentially control of infectious lameness in sheep, for example, uh, really isn't going to work for neonatal survival. We do need to determine the risk factors on the individual farm level and we need interventions, um, as I said, also potentially the targets as well uh, to be both achievable and tailored to the farm. And uh, as a bit of a teaser for um, what we'd like to talk about later on in the year, hopefully in the summer when we can all get together face to face and actually do this in a 
more sociable and enjoyable environment than sat in front of our computers in the evenings. Um, but we piloted a, um, a control plan uh, to really target survival on about 40 farms. Uh, this was really spearheaded by Emily Gascoigne down um, at Synergy, but we had a few farms that we did up uh, in the University of Edinburgh practice as well. Uh, looking at the key factors in so nutrition, shelter, infection, colostrum and breeding, uh, and of course with the farm team at the centre of that, and, and how we can try and come up with uh, tailored and specific and relevant and achievable um, interventions at the farm level to try and improve uh, performance and uh, the plan over the summer really is, is hopefully we can all get together for face-to-face -to -face meetings and to really run some CPD looking at what um, evidence there was behind this and, and what Emily and, and our vets in Edinburgh did with the farms to try and um, implement this and, and the feedback we got from the farms as well with a view to, to sort of rolling it out and trying it on, on more farms across the UK. So I, I failed miserably there to keep that to 40 minutes, um, but I did leave time for discussion. So hopefully, um, I'm not sure whether it's Liz or Nia who's, who's collecting the questions, uh, but hopefully the, there's an opportunity there to, to discuss things. I do need to recognise the huge amount of work that's been done by other people. I'm here talking to you tonight, standing on the shoulders of um, you know, a lot of other people. Um, that have really worked incredibly hard to pull this data together. Not to mention, of course, all the farmers um, that have worked with our students and, and with the vets to collect that data and to work with us as well. That's great. Thank you, Alex. Um, that was really, really excellent. Thank you so much. Um, before we move on to Rebecca, who will be taking the questions, I just want to remind everyone that um, a feedback form will pop up um, when you go to leave the webinar tonight and we'd really appreciate it if you could just take time to fill it in please and if you have any suggestions when you do it. So um, Rebecca will be taking questions now and she is the animal health welfare scientist for AHDB. Thanks Naya. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming through so please add on to them if you've got anything else you'd like to ask. So Alex, can you clarify what 10% losses means? Is it 10 out of every 100 lambs die or reared lambing percentage falls by 10%? Yeah, so it's of the proportion of lambs that were born alive uh, for our vet and our um, vet student collected data. So it was every, of everything that was born, 10%, let's say, uh, for the lambs uh, died. Great, thank you. Um, another one coming through. So did you alter the feeding or management of sheep uh, with suboptimal metabolic profiles pre-lambing? <laughs> no, this is the thing that we want to do next. <laughs> so this is, so um, I think the person that's asked that question might be aware of John Vipon's work where he's been feeding uh, soya uh, the rate of what's 100 grams per fetus to sheep and if you look at his work some studies show an improvement in performance some studies don't and we're really interested in that inconsistency why do some studies show improvement and others don't is it because it depends on the long-term protein status of that sheep in the first place so that's exactly what we want to do next we want to split use up based on their albumin levels and either supplement them or not supplement them to see whether that explains why some flocks or some trials published by other authors show an improvement in performance with protein supplementation whilst others don't. And that could actually form quite a useful basis behind making nutritional decisions. You know, we can, if that plays out, we can then actually say, well, these sheep do need supplementing, whereas these ones don't, um, and try and be a little bit more refined in the way that we um, use protein, which is obviously a very expensive feed supplement. Great, thank you. Um, do you have any advice on how to broach the topic of stopping routine antibiotic administration to lambs post birth? Yeah, a really difficult subject and um, again didn't have time to talk about the social sciences on that as much but one of the real problems was that for quite a few years giving antibiotics routinely to all lambs at birth was considered best practice and now we're saying don't do it. So there's this sort of dissonance, particularly for folk that have um, been farming for some time, uh, between you know, what was considered best practice once upon a time and, and what the current messaging is. The difficulties, of course, is moving forward in terms of uh, the fear that when you stop doing it, all the wheels come off. And I think the first thing to do is obviously go through and look at 
the risk factors first. So are you convinced that colostrum management is where it needs to be? Are you convinced that perinatal nutrition is where it needs to be? Is hygiene good? Um, are, are all these risk factors currently well managed? Because if they're not, and you pull them off the antibiotics straight away, then you're going to have a big problem potentially, and then you end up losing them. So can you start by getting the risk factors lined up and, and use that as the route into the discussion before then worrying about um, pulling them off it? And then when you're starting to move them off, again, we had the same conversation with our farm because our farm um, used to use it routinely a few years ago. Obviously, in this study, they didn't get a choice how it was used. It was used randomly. Um, and, and they'd move much more onto, well, we'll have some on the farm, but we won't use it routinely. Um, and when they have a problem, they, they then move in and, and, and use it in response to an issue. And there's always then the difficult conversation of, well, I've lost two or three lambs to watery mouth that I feel like I wouldn't have lost had I been using them routinely. But it, it's a way of starting to get them away from uh, the routine use of the oral antibiotics. And actually, after doing this study with our flock, um, they're, they're just not using it at all. So they didn't use any oral antibiotics last year whatsoever, and they're not planning to this year. So it is a really hard conversation. Um, and uh, of course, bad years really do um, frame people's attitudes towards it and what they're prepared to do next as well. But I, I would say start with the risk factors first, try and get those covered in as many ways as you can before you then move from a blanket to a, um, to a responsive treatment or of course, you know, we know that, you know, being a triplet is going to put you at higher risk. So saying, okay, well, should we start this year by not doing the singles and, and trying to ease them into a bit more gently? Great, thank you. Um, what did the forage analysis look like, um, I assume, during the sheep trial? Um, it was it was all right. Um, I knew someone would ask me and I thought I should have had this lined up. So um, do you want to Ask me the next one. I'll try and pull it up whilst also trying to answer the next question. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, what do you think is the main cause of higher neonatal survival in cows moved to pens after calving compared to cows moved to pens pre-calving? Yeah, a really good question. Because at the moment, it's just an observation. It's just a sort of a correlation that we found. And um, it's interesting, actually, when you look into literature, I mentioned this stuff in Canada, but it's also shown in... Um, in dairy if you change groups in the run up to calving. So I think it's more, uh, you're reducing survival if you move them in the run up to calving rather than necessarily improving survival by moving them 24 hours after. I think it's really that disruption in terms of the social stress potentially impact um, on their intakes as well in, in the run up to calving. Um, so I think it's more a social behavioral thing in terms of you disrupted them in the run up to calving rather than um, you're improving their survival uh, by moving them 24 hours after. Now, I just need to be a bit careful because I am only really um, sort of trying to think from first principles here. And of course, you have got the Sandhills carving system, which is a very structured way of moving animals after carving that has really shown an improvement in survival. But that's very different. And none of the farms we were working with were using the Sandhills carving system. Um, but you know, there are certainly um, systems where moving them regularly uh, after calving uh, can actually improve survival by reducing contamination of, of calving paddocks. But anyway, I don't think that applies so much to our study. Okay, great. Do you want me to move on to the next one or? Uh, it's just opening. Right, so the silage analysis for um, the farm was 42% dry matter, uh, the D value wasn't amazing, it was 69%, an ME of 11.1, so we had reasonably good ME levels, and a pretty average crude protein level at 13%, or 13, uh, 130 grams per kilogram dry matter. So uh, it was good quality, uh, you know, in terms of energy, it was pretty, um, pretty satisfactory in terms of crude protein, uh, and it was quite dry, if that answers the question in terms of forage that those sheep were getting. Great, thank you for pulling that up. Um, next question is, was there any differences between IgG levels for different colostrum replacers or were it all not great? <laughs> well, this is a different piece of work that wasn't done by me. This was done by uh, Murray Cork at the University of Cambridge. So um, our, our flock, um, in terms of the study we did, they were actually using bovine uh, colostrum uh, from the dairy farm as a replacement. That's not necessarily something we recommend. It's just something that the farm has always done. Um, the 
third we worked with in Rachel study uh, they just told us whether they were using commercial or um, cow's colostrum. So we didn't actually measure any of the IgG in the colostrum they were using. The work from Murray Cork uh, was interesting in that he did show there was quite a big range and actually none of the colostrum replacers he published on, I think, got to the 100 grams of IgG, which was recommended for calves. I can't remember what he showed on on the sh on the uh, sheep side that he's done, but he has published on both. Uh, so that's other people's work, um, and it is actually out uh, in the public domain to to go and have a look at. Thank you. Um, so on the farms that had beef and sheep that had higher calf mortality, were they lambing and calving at the same time, or were some of them autumn calvers? Uh, we were looking at their spring calving performance. So some of them will have had autumn calving herds, but we were not looking at that performance. So yes, of the ones we were looking at, they were, la they were lambing and calving at the same time. Great, thank you. Um, just losing there, Rebecca. Oh, can you hear me now? That's better. <laughs> Sorry. So, rather than numerical targets, aim for consistency and trend improvement. I think that's right. Yeah. If I understand, if I heard all of that, I, I would say um, at the moment there are some farms that are able to achieve consistent performance that can now start to work on marginal gains and you know incremental improvements. There are many where just getting to the point of consistency would be a big win. Yeah. OK, thank you. I think just one more to come through here then. Um, any thoughts on refractometer usage to evaluate colostrum? Uh, to come. <laughs> so um, we've used it a lot in beef. In, uh, beef um, and yeah, I think it's I think it's fine. Um, the commonest mistake folk do is that they only take a little bit of the colostrum and of course we know that the consistency of colostrum changes through the secretion so if you're going to do it you have to strip the cow out and say right I now have three or four litres of colostrum and now I'm going to measure um, its, its uh, density using a refractometer so I think that's fine on the sheep side um, we haven't really done enough work on it so it's another area of interest I think um, one of my colleagues Amy Jennings has been looking at this over the past few years but um, I would say generally um, where folk have gone wrong is where they've just taken a few squirts out of each tea and said oh we'll measure that um, rather than saying that we're going to take the full three litres off a cow we're going to take 400 mils off a ewe um, and we're going to measure um, the overall um, density of, of that whole sample rather than just part of the secretion. Okay, I think that's um, all the questions now. Um, so thank you very much, Alex, for um, coming on tonight. Um, just to let you know that we will be repeating this webinar um, or a similar webinar on the 21st, specifically for farmers. So um, if you would like to recommend to do that would be great. Um, and just a reminder, if you could fill out the feedback form at the end, that would be great. Thank you all. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you, Josh.